Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. And while we pull up the slides, I would just like to congratulate David Ilson on this wonderful alumni award. Very well deserved. I'm going to a wonderful colleague. And I also want to congratulate Yelena Zhenzhigian on putting together what looks like a wonderful program over the next two days. So what I hope to do today is to uh, bring you up to date on what we are doing for esophageal gastric cancer in terms of genetic t testing. Obviously, there's much more information for gastric than esophageal cancer. Here are my disclosures, um, nothing uh, relevant, uh, but my husband does consult for ophthalmology for a variety of companies. So studies from the Scandinavian countries of large twin registries have shown that monozygotic and, and dizygotic twins, um, the, the rate of, of genetic susceptibility to cancers is higher than one's thought. In fact, when you look at even environmental cancers like lung cancer, there seems to be familial clustering. And this can be potentially um, genetic risk or genetic risk mediated by environmental exposure. Um, the same is in, in stomach cancer, where you see that the heritable fraction is probably about 20 to 25 percent. Again, whether that risk is mediated by shared environmental risk factors that Dr. Tang mentioned, such as H. pylori, or a true genetic um, uh, high-risk mutation is still yet to be determined. But what we know today is that probably about 5 to 10 percent of gastric cancers um, have uh, a high-risk um, uh, predisposition syndrome. What about familial uh, risk of esophageal cancer? This is the only slide I have on esophageal cancer because there's not that much data on it. But there are some epidemiological studies suggesting that individuals um, who are first degree relatives of patients with esophageal cancer are at about a two-fold increased risk of esophageal cancer themselves. This is a recent paper that was published in 2018. And what they also suggested is that a family history of adenocarcinoma or squamous cell type um, uh, esophageal cancer increase the familial risk of that concordant histological cancer subtype, which is somewhat interesting and provocative. Again, is that genetic or is that shared environmental exposures? We don't yet know. There have been a number of genome-wide association studies in esophageal cancer. All of those effect sizes were very small, so really we do not use that uh, in a clinical setting. Uh, the clinical utility of those have not been proven. This is very different than in gastric cancer, where we have a number of known high-risk, high-penetrance cancer predisposition syndromes. You have already heard from Dr. Tang regarding hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. I highlight it here because this is the only um, uh, inherited um, syndrome within in gastric cancer that, uh, pre that uh, predicts for a diffuse subtype. All of the other ones are intestinal subtype. What's new here is that there is a relatively new gene. It's very rare, but CTNNA1 also causes diffuse gastric cancer. Only a few families have been described, but in patients who are very high risk, have a very strong family history, we do sometimes test for that as well. It's also associated with lobular breast cancer, which I'll describe. Other syndromes are Lynn syndrome, um, Leafromani. You do get familial clustering of gastric cancers in patients with Leafromani syndrome. FVP is interesting. In its traditional form, the risk of stomach cancer is quite low in individuals with, with FAP. However, there's a version of it called gastric adenocarcinoma and proximal polyposis of the stomach called GAPS. And for years, we did not know what the genetic etiology of GAPS was. What these patients develop is exactly as the um, name would suggest, very proximal polyps, but a very high risk of gastric cancer. And lo and behold, a few years ago, a promoter region of the APC gene was implicated as causing this GAPS. And these patients have more gastric fund polyps than actually polyps of their colon. So this is something that we assess in some of our patients that we see in clinic. Putziagers and juvenile polyps, uh, polyposis fall into the hamartomatous polyposis syndrome. And the lifetime risk of gastric cancer associated uh, with these syndromes is, is about 20 percent, so quite a high risk. So why is genetic risk, uh, risk assessment so important in gastric cancer? Well, as Dr. Um, Strong will um, talk about next, obviously it plays a role in pre-surgical decision making in total gastrectomy versus, versus partial gastrectomy. More and more we are starting to recognize that recognizing Lynn syndrome or an MSI high tumor has, has implications for treatment. And then, of course, for our survivors of gastric cancer, there's future prevention and surveillance so we can keep them healthy. And then last but not least, we can also keep families healthy. We can do predictive testing for unaffected family members and do the appropriate cancer screening and surveillance so that we recognize cancer early or even prevent cancers. 
So this, um, uh, Dr. Tang alluded to the Maori uh, family that was first described with familial gastric cancer. This is quite an ex uh, 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 impressive uh, pedigree, even for me, and I've seen a lot of pedigrees. Um, you can see that it's clearly autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. There are over 25 members of this family um, affected with gastric cancer, and the, you can see that the youngest uh, uh, boy was 14 years old at the diagnosis of gastric cancer. So eventually, in 1998, this was um, uh, uh, linked to CDH1, which codes E. cadherin, and E. cadherin is a protein that really prevents um, uh, cell deregulation and cell adhesion, and so if you have a mutation in CDH1, then unfortunately you get excessive proliferation and eventually um, tumor progression. Now, there have been a lot of guidelines in terms of who do we evaluate for hereditary diffuse gastric cancer? The original guidelines were published in 1999, updated in 2010, and now updated in 2015. And the criteria have become a little bit more broad. The current criteria suggest that two individuals with gastric cancer, regardless of age, if one is confirmed to have diffuse gastric cancer, should be evaluated for CDH1 mutation. This confirmation of diffuse gastric cancer can be very difficult, as you can imagine, because you actually do need to get a pathology report saying that, that that's what it was. Uh, also, any individual with early onset uh, diffuse gastric cancer diagnosed under the age of 40. At our institution, we're a little bit more liberal, and we do test patients between the ages of 40 to 45 as well, although the pickup rate in an isolated diffuse gastric cancer at that age is quite rare or individuals with a personal or family history of diffuse gastric cancer and lobular breast cancer, which again has been linked to the syndrome, with one individual diagnosed under the age of 50. There are some additional uh, testing considerations that I won't get into. So what's the risk of cancer uh, with hereditary diffuse gastric cancer? There have been three large studies looking at this starting in 2001. The most up-to-date is the Hansford study published in 2015, suggesting that men have a 70% lifetime risk of uh, gastric cancer, women 56%, and women are at about a 40% lifetime risk of a lobular breast cancer. Um, which is different from the ductal breast cancers, which we see in about 95% of our breast cancer patients. The age at onset is highly variable. Um, in New Zealand, the mean age is 33. In our population, it tends to be around age 40. There's also no evidence currently that the risk of other cancer types is increased. So there were some initial publications suggesting that maybe there was an increased risk of colon cancer. I think most of those have been refuted, and we do not counsel patients as being at an increased risk of any other cancer except these two. So the management, um, Dr. Strom will talk about, obviously, the prophylactic gastrectomy. There is potentially a role of endoscopy uh, with multiple biopsies, but the efficacy of that technique has never been, uh, been, been proven. For our women with CDH1 uh, mutations, we start MRI and mammogram screening at age 30 because of the high risk of lobular breast cancer, and MRI is much more sensitive at detecting lobular breast cancers. Now, this is one of the reasons why, unfortunately, um, Screening with endoscopy doesn't work. So these are the gastrectomy samples of eight different uh, individuals with CDH1 mutations who all underwent upper endoscopy prior to their surgery. Um, and as Dr. Tang uh, pointed out, there is no mass seen. But when you look very carefully, and this is why we need pathologists like Dr. Tang to look at this, what you see is that in each of these specimens, these little stars, represent foci of signet ring cells. So all of these individuals did, in fact, have at least two or more foci of signet ring cells in their prophylactic uh, gastrectomy samples. So the recommendation for these patients is to have their stomach out. Now, one of the controversies that has come up in CDH1 is who should we do gastrectomy for everyone? And this has come up because we moved from single gene testing, where we only tested for CDH1, to what we now do in genetics um, across the country, multi-gene testing, and this, is, this has become available with the advent of next-gen sequencing. So instead of just looking for CDH1, you do a slew of genes. And in fact, CDH1 is um, incorporated on many cancer panels, including colon cancer panels, breast cancer panels. So we are testing individuals for CDH1 who don't meet criteria for CDH1 testing. So what does this result in? Well, this is one family we saw. This was a 52-year-old woman with uh, rectal uh, cancer and she underwent surgery. Her IHC for screening for Lynch syndrome was normal, and she had a very large multi-gene panel at the outside, and she was found to have 
a CDH1 alteration. I call it an alteration because one laboratory classified as a likely pathogenic mutation, while another laboratory classifies it as a variant of un unknown significance. So do, what do we do with that result? <coughs> when we segregated this to the cousin with breast cancer, whose breast cancer, by the way, happened to be a lobular breast cancer, she also carried the, the um, CDH1 alteration which means that this uncle and this father were obligate carriers, but they do not have gastric cancer. So what is the penetrance? What is the risk of gastric cancer in a family like this? And what do we recommend for these individuals? There are resources for this. Prompt is trying to study this, which is collecting families with variants and families with moderate risk uh, genes to evaluate the penetrance of this. And there are also resources such as ClinVar, which are trying to better classify variants of unknown significance. The situation gets even harder when you're looking at unaffected individuals. So this was a 40-year-old woman who did not have any cancer, since she came to us because she underwent a large breast panel because of her grandmother's early onset breast cancer. CD, she was found to have a likely pathogenic variant in CDH1. This is, this is one of the cases that certainly lowers my stomach pH and Dr. Shatner's as well, because what we are doing is screening. But you saw the screening results. So are we doing the right thing by not sending this woman to Dr. Strong? Although I think Dr. Strong did see her in consultation. What do we do with these cases? So <clears throat> I think what we are running into is in genetic studies, we know that there is an issue called ascertainment bias. The initial families that come to you for testing have a much higher risk of cancer because those are the families that are going to initially come. So over time, just like in BRCA, usually the penetrance or the, life, the, the, the risk of cancer goes down through time. So what we are running into as we broaden CDH1 testing to individuals who don't meet criteria, we are having trouble interpreting the results of a CDH1 genetic change in these patients. So what should be quoted for penetrance and risk in families who don't clearly show the syndrome? And what should be the management recommendation for these patients? These are big questions within this field. I just came back from San Diego from the Collaborative Groups of America meeting. Uh, which was, used to be called the Inherited Colorectal Cancer Meeting, and I'm very glad to say that they changed their name to Inherited GI Cancer Meeting to account for the, the to acknowledge the inherited risk in pancreas and gastric cancers. But there was one late-breaking abstract that they presented, not small numbers, families, only 41, but they segregated the penetrance according to how much gastric cancer there was in the family. And you can see if you had fewer than, two or fewer gastric cancers in the family, then the lifetime risk was much lower than what you saw before, which was 70% and 12% in women. So these new studies are really going to change how we may manage these uh, patients. So moving on to Lynch syndrome, stomach cancer is definitely a part of Lynch syndrome, but it's not as common. One of the studies shows that maybe the lifetime uh, prevalence is, uh, is about 13%. Lynch syndrome, we know, is uh, a defect in the mismatch repair uh, genes, and we can uh, test for mismatch repair defects either through immunohistochemical staining for the four mismatch repair proteins with absent staining designating an MMRD or mismatch repair deficient tumor, or via traditional microsatellite PCR-based uh, analysis. Either one of these techniques is, is pretty good. We generally do uh, reflex testing for MMRD in our endometrial and colon cancer cases on everyone who is resected here to look for a marker of Lynch syndrome. Over the years, this has become very important because obviously you know the data on the effectiveness of immunotherapy in MSI high or MMRD uh, cancers, and in, in fact, there is FDA approval of pembrolizumab in advanced uh, uh, solid tumor patients with MMRD. So, MS, so MSI testing has become a little bit more broad in the oncology community. In fact, there is a new testing method of um, identifying MSI through next-gen sequencing methodologies. And we have one of these methods in place for our MSK impact patients, and this is called MSI sensor. MSI sensor is essentially just an algorithm that helps quantify a tumor as being MSI high or MSI low by assessing the microsatellites at um, each region and then doing a chi-square st statistic and then a multiple uh, testing correction for it. In our lab, if you have an MSI sensor score of over 10, you get a designation of being MSI high. Three to 10 is MSI indeterminate, and less than three is a microsatellite stable tumor. Um, Sumit Mita and Jacqueline Heckman did a very nice job of validating these findings in colorectal and endometrial uh, tumors. 
So what we wanted to do is since everyone was getting MSK impact testing, we wanted to determine the prevalence of Lynch syndrome in all of our patients who were undergoing MSK impact testing according to MSI status. Um, this was uh, an effort led by um, uh, Dr. Latham, who is, uh, who is a medical genetics fellow with us, and by Preeti Srinivasan, who is a PhD uh, student in do um, Dr. Berger's lab. And we presented this data at ASCO as a late-breaking aspect this year, but what I want to highlight to you is when we look at MSI across the um, across different types of tumors, you certainly see MSI in the gastric cancer patients, very few in the esophageal uh, gastric patients. In some studies assessing MSI, this frequency is even higher than what we see here. When we looked at um, the prevalence of Lynch syndrome in these 15,000 patients according to MSI, what we found is that in our MSI high patients, 16% of patients had, um, had a Lynch syndrome, but only about a half having the canonical colon and endometrial cancer. So what were these other half? In the MSI indeterminate, the, the prevalence of Lynch was about 2%, and in the MSS uh, cohort, it was actually equal to the population risk of, of Lynch. And what you see here is in gastric cancer, you certainly have MSI high tumors. We only had about two uh, patients who had Lynch, meaning they were uh, positive for a germline mutation. And in fact, it's, I think it's very fair to say that the vast majority of MSI high in gastric cancer is due to MLH1 promoter hypermethylation, not Lynch syndrome. But the, the treatment remains the same. They're both responsive to immunotherapy, as I think Elena will discuss later today. So um, just to summarize, 50% of Lynch patients with MSI high tumors have tumors other than colon cancer and endometrial cancer, so you have to think of it in other cancers. And for, get, for uh, gastric cancer, the vast majority of MSI high are sporadic. So we also looked at, with uh, Yelena Jinjigian, um, germline analysis sort of across the board of gastric and esophageal uh, cancer patients. As you know, we have our MSK impact somatic panel. Uh, which in analyzes 468 genes, but there's a secondary level of consent that one can do. We often refer to, the, refer to it as the Part C protocol, but basically includes consent for germline testing of 88 different cancer pre predisposition genes. The patient watch, watch a short uh, educational video and then have their germline analysis done. The oncologist usually tells them the result, and in genetics we follow up those with a positive result. The genes highlighted in blue represent the cancer susceptibility genes on this panel. So we evaluated this in 400 uh, patients that, that, that our GI medical oncologists consented uh, patients to. Most of these were, in fact, metastatic. The breakdown was about 50% gastric, 50% uh, esophageal. And what you see is you see a higher rate of mutations in gastric than esophageal cancer, and that's not a surprise. Some of the findings in esophageal cancer were more like incidental findings, like a founder mutation in a patient with esophageal cancer that had nothing to do with their esophageal cancer. And what we saw in gastric was that 9% of patients had high or moderate penetrance mutations. And what were these mutations? So interestingly, what popped out as one of the most frequent ones, frequent ones was ATM. And ATM mutations are historically associated with an increased risk of breast cancer and more recently, definitely an increased risk of uh, pancreas cancer. Um, so is it also a risk gene for gastric cancer? Well, our data seems to suggest that, but uh, obviously validation of that is still needed. What you also see is some other um, homologous re recombination defect uh, genes being involved, including BRCA2 and BRCA1. Uh, so just to show you two of these pedigrees, this is one of our very early onset gastric cancer patients with an ATM germline mutation, and what you see is the uh, family history of gastric cancer as well. We have yet to segregate the mutation to make sure that it's coming from this side but still it's, it's quite remarkable that uh, this young wom woman had uh, ATM mutation and gastric cancer. This was another individual, also very early onset gastric cancer, 35-year-old, who had a germline mutation in the BRCA2 gene. But when we looked in the tumor, what we uh, also noted was a somatic mutation, suggesting that indeed her gastric cancer was driven by this BRCA2 mutation. This is not what we usually see in BRCA, so we see um, ovarian cancer after the age of 40, and breast cancer in young women, not gastric cancer. So is BRCA2 especially also a, a risk gene for um, gastric cancer like it is in pancreas cancer? Possibly. So just to conclude, gastric cancer is known to be associated with multiple known inherited cancer predisposition syndromes. I think that, that the literature regarding uh, HDGC and changing penetrance is evolving. 
In Lynch, um, we do universal assessment in colon and endometrial cancer. Is it time to do universal assessment in our gastric cancer patients? Possibly. And clearly with germline tumor DNA analysis, we are detecting more and more changes that are potentially, uh, potentially targetable, including in the homologous recombination deficiency genes like BRCA1, 2, and ATM. And then last but not least, I would like to thank um, the GI oncology service, um, gastroenterology, surgery, and pathology, because treating these patients is really a truly multidisciplinary effort. So I think we all work together um, and stress over these patients um, in terms of how to best manage them. Thank you.